Thank you. <laughs> you know, uh, can we have the house lights on so I can see everyone? <laughs> oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for such a warm welcome and I'd like to thank uh, the Belfast Film Festival for having, having me here and giving me this opportunity to visit this lovely place and to meet all of you. Thank you so much. Good evening, everyone. And we, I would also like to add my thanks to the Belfast Film Festival, to Michelle Devlin and to Mark, Tom, uh, Mark Cousins, who introduced us, and everyone who is part of their team. It's been a wonderful experience working with them, and I hope you will all enjoy this evening. Uh, I thought I would start with the fact that you've just seen this clip, Amir of uh, Lagan. Yeah. And uh, what is very interesting is that if we look at the kind of history of cinema and the way that you have been also involved with it, you see that the entry of the hero is a big moment in Hindi films, just as much as they greeted you here today. <laughs> the film always sets up this uh, entrance of the hero. And do you think that the hero has changed a lot over the years and how? Oh, my God, that's a tough one. Yeah? Well, it, it's not always uh, that you get a hero's entry um, in films. And uh, it really depends on how the, the structure of the screenplay is, is uh, kind of, you know, uh, revealing itself. So sometimes you, you do write in a, a character which, uh, a scene which kind of gives you a hero's entry. And most of my films don't have that. Most of my films don't really have a hero's entry. You know, a lot more of, I think, Maybe Salman or Shah Rukh's film have that really, you know, heroic moment of them. <laughs> no, and I love it as much, you know, I really love it. Uh, or, you know, Akshay and Ajay, they've got yes. this hero's end. I don't usually have that. Yes. Uh, sometimes I miss it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but what is the other part of but the But do you feel that actually the hero has changed, the character of the hero has changed in your own time, in your own work? Well, I guess it, it does uh, change, you know, it, it changes with uh, what's happening around in society, you know, with every decade or so, you know, I think in the 70s when Mr. Bachchan was uh, uh, the person who was really affecting all of us, at that time, the writer Salim Javed were writing about, the, the, the hero they were writing about was someone who was rebelling against the system. And you had a very strong villain character or an antagonist character. Um, mm. Sometimes I feel more than the hero, it's the, it's the villains that decide, mm. you know? Because in the 70s, I remember the smugglers were always the villains. Mm. You remember? <laughs> the villains were always the smugglers, you know, they were smuggling gold or something like that. And then, and then later on, it became the politicians. You always had the corrupt politician and the corrupt cop and all of that. So I think it's perhaps it's the villains that really decide. Yes, and then the father who would object he also has vanished. Yeah, well, has he? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so I, I think it, it kind of moves with times. Yes. The heroes and, and characters around, yeah, they move with time, you're right. It seems you're to, right. really, yeah. there's a big change. And it's a marker that the audience has changed, just as much as the audience here. The expectations of a Hindi film are quite different from even five years ago. Yes, I think from the time that I came into the films in India, which was 88, from there to now, it's been 30 years, and I've, I've noticed a huge change. I remember, uh, in fact, the kind of films we make now are more my kind of films. Mm. I remember when I came in 88, uh, I kind of felt a little out of place. I felt that everything that I had to, that everything that I loved and I wanted to be a part of, it was very difficult to get it made. Mm. Because the mainstream market was looked at it with a lot of suspicion, you know? A film like Jojita Bohi Sikandar or a film like Andaz Apna Apna. Uh, these are stories and scripts that I loved. But it was very difficult to get these films made. And why? Do you think they thought it was a risky subject? Yeah, because at that time, what was really popular 
was uh, these, you know... Um, is the big action here also? The, the, yeah, it, was the, it is a time of... You know, I don't know whether I should say it. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, I'm, I'm very much a lover of cinema. So when I say this, I say this with a lot of love. You know, you must understand that. And in the 80s, as an audience, when I was watching films in the 80s, I felt we were making the worst kind of films at that time. You know, when I look at the 50s and 60s, yeah. you know, uh, so I won't say all the films of the 80s, of course, but I'm saying when we look at the 50s and 60s, we had films with such wonderful music, you know, such amazing lyrics, the writers at that time, the, the actors at that time, you know, Nargis Ji, uh, Raj Kapoor, Dilip Kumar. So, uh, as an audience, I, I felt that the 80s was, you know, it was like, I don't know, the disco era, I don't know what to call it. You know, it was... <laughs> Kasam peda karne wale ki and jala kar raak kar dunga and you know yeah. uh, films which did well by the way you know and, and there was an audience for these yes. films so I'm not deriding that I'm just saying it was not my kind of cinema if it, it, it was films that were popular at that time but they were not my kind of cinema and and I respect the audience which likes that film those films but uh, for me to do the kind of films I wanted was very difficult you know it was an uphill task trying to do films that I believed in, because the market didn't believe in them. You know, Dil Hai Ke Maanta Nahi, for example, was a film that I loved, but it was very difficult to get it, get it made and get it released, because uh, it was against the... I mean, I was doing films which was against what is mainstream, what, what was then that, considered yeah. mainstream, because at that time, mainstream was very narrow. It had a very uh, limited, uh, I, I guess, uh, definition. And then I think with, with, with me and other people who came into the film industry at that time, we kind of started pushing the envelope and <laughs> changing the rules a bit. And, and I think the audience also grew with time. And I feel today is the time when I, the, what has become mainstream now is more my kind of cinema. You know, films like Dangal or uh, many films that, you know, uh, yes. we see. But I think a film like Jo Jita was for his sake of that is amazing if you all so, so see to, it together. So to get back to your amazing. point is there's been a huge change in 30 yeah. years. Audiences have changed, filmmakers have changed. What The kind of films Indian cinema makes has changed dramatically. So Indian cinema, I don't know about the rest of the world, but Indian cinema has it's really it's been uh, throbbing, you know, with, with lots of things happening in it. But I, when we come to talking about Jo Jita, it's fascinating how much... I'm, have many people seen it here? <laughs> wow. So basically, wow. it's amazing how it has influenced the films that came from the 90s and yeah. up to now. Yeah, yeah. The kind of hero, the kind of aspirations, yeah. and the kind of friendships between men and women. That film has a lot to answer for yeah. <laughs> in many ways. Now, when we look at Lagan, obviously everybody must have seen Lagan. Yeah. yeah. And I think um, the character of Bhuvan, I remember when we were talked a few years ago about Bhuvan, and you told me some fascinating things about how you developed his character. You know, because, of course, Amir is not just a very wonderful actor, but he gives so much of uh, attention to detail in characterization. And you were telling me how you got him, the way he walked, yeah, the yeah, way yeah, he yeah, was. I remember that, yeah. that was fascinating because... I could, I'm sure people would well, be interested. Yeah, so, you know, I was actually... Um, I think I was giving an example of how you the body work, like, work yes. on the character. So, yeah. um, you know, Lagan, for example, Bhuvan, uh, when I read the script, the most remarkable quality about Bhuvan, I felt, was his inner strength, his conviction. When he, when he believes in something, he just is... He backs it like a rock, you know, he doesn't, he doesn't budge. So his inner strength was what, what was his most remarkable quality. Along with that, um, um, he has to be innocent. Because only an innocent person will say yes to such an absurd bet. <laughs> you know, when the British officer tells him that you have to beat us in the game of cricket. He doesn't know what cricket is at that point of time. He has no idea what it is, but he just decides that whatever it is, we'll beat you at it. So you have to have a certain amount of innocence when you say that. Because if you're, if you're shrewd, you would probably say, this is a bet I'm not going to win. Mm. It's his innocence that makes him say yes to the bet. So he's a combination of inner strength and innocence. Now, when you project strength, 
it's it's quite contrary you know to innocence and when you project innocence you start taking away from the strength so i was telling you at that time i have to like kind of stand up a little bit yes, so people, so so bhuvan is someone uh, i was thinking that when you know when you want to project someone who's got a lot of inner strength he's not someone who stands like this his his weight is never on one leg it's usually centered so the weight of bhuvan is equally on both feet his back is very straight and he's you know this is what bhuvan looks like you know so he looks very slowly he's not he's not like akash from dil chahta hai who I did immediately after that who's got you know who's constantly uh, he's got a very naughty look in his eyes and he's his eyes don't stop in one place for very long he's constantly looking at you but talking to somebody else you know uh now the thing about that was that when when i had to get in innocence into bhuvan without taking away from the strength mm. and i was wondering how to do that and and innocence usually is you know with wide eyes you know when you're wide eyed you look innocent but the moment you go wide eyed you take away from the strength mm. so i was trying to figure out how to do that and then i met nikki contractor who's a makeup artist in in india and i was telling him this i was like what do i do i don't understand what to do and he said you know what just curl your eyelashes <laughs> and that's what i did so what what he said is that when 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 you shoot a close up you need, your your eyelashes usually droop down and they cover your eyes a bit you know you don't realize it until you look at it very closely so for for lagan i didn't perform in the sense at all i just curled my eyelashes up <laughs> so what happens is your eyes they kind of instead of instead of looking like this they kind of go a touch <laughs> if you know what i mean a touch more open you know and 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 that gives that little touch of innocence brings in that so so that's what i did for for bhuvan actually you know brought in the strength in the body language mm-hmm. and I, in the steadiness of the eyes yeah you know when we saw the clip what was to me most interesting about that that introduction when you come within a few minutes you establish the character mm. here is a person who is going to defend the innocent yeah and so they he chases away the deer in order to save them he's trying to and save the deer yes yeah. and in a way that little scene is symbolic of the whole film yeah yeah because yeah. he will find methods mm. to save the whole village yeah and i thought that was really fascinating and in many films what is wonderful about the way you characterize uh, the people you play is that they are tell you very quickly who they are mm-hmm. there's no ambivalence yes but you know that's usually part of the writing the credit for that really should go to ashutosh who wrote that scene you know when when i heard the script myself he begins by narrating this and you look he's he's looking at the deer and he's got a stone in his hand and you're like why does he want to throw a stone on a deer here yeah? mm. for one second you feel he's not such a good guy he's throwing stones at deers and then you realize he's doing it to distract yeah. the deer yeah you know so he wants to save the deer actually uh, just yes. before uh, captain russell fires yes uh, so i thought that's a really well written scene extremely yeah. well written scene yeah. now you know this uh, so many different characters you play then now we have to look at dangal and uh, dangal have every has everyone seen it <laughs> so we don't have to tell you the story but basically it anyone here who hasn't seen it it is about a father and it's based on a true life story of a father who trains his two daughters at wrestling again here you see the dedication with which amir researches what wrestling is so that there's a scene which we're now going to see you will immediately see that it's not fake he's understood the moves um if you don't mind we can yeah, watch yeah, yeah. it can we I see i can watch it on this yes clip number 2 please <laughs> a wonderful scene i was going to ask you like you know what kind of persons or the characters that you meet people that you meet would inspire such a person but I'd like to know who inspired this character. <laughs> You're trying to get me into trouble. Oh. <laughs> But actually um, Adwait wrote this character so where he got the inspiration for this character you'll have to ask him. But uh, when he wrote it a lot of people came into my mind <laughs> who have met from the film industry. So it's actually a mix of I've taken different things from different people to be quite honest. Uh Yes because it's nothing like you in real yeah, life. Yeah, I hope so. <laughs> But it's a f- sorry? Image picture please. Uh 
So actually, it's it's a mix of Shakti Kapoor, uh, uh, Anu Malik, and many, 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 many people, many people. But all, all, all I mean, I love all these people. So, uh, and it was really fun for me to do this character because it's so different from me, and I was trying to do it with with some amount of. Uh, so you know, he's he's quite a shallow person. You know, I saw Shakti. As as quite a shallow person, so even in his politically absolutely incorrect behavior all the time, even in that he's shallow. <laughs> he doesn't seriously mean anything, you know. Almost. So even when he's saying he talks about women in in such a derogatory way, yes. I'm not I'm not even sure how much he means it. You know, he's just saying it yeah. for for effect. He wants to be cool. He wants to be cool. Uh, so so I just saw him as a really shallow character. Um, and there's another scene in the film which is really funny actually i don't know how many people get that humor is after he finally manages to get the you know the girl does a wonderful recording and he's they stop on the way he's going to drop her to the airport he stop on the way to have some nimbu pani and then he talks about the fact that how he's always had a raw deal in life and you know uh, that scene is so funny because actually he's saying the most absurd things and he's telling her that you know my life is exactly like yours so i understand what you're going through And she listens to him, and she says, "That's not like my life at all." <laughs> you know, there is a similarity between you and me. Yes. But he's he's like oblivious to that. So I found him a really charming character. He's just in his own world and doesn't care about anyone. Uh, and I actually tested for this character because when I when I when Adwait said he wanted me to play the character, I was like, I'm not sure if I'm I'll be able to pull this off. Mm. And um, maybe we should cast. uh you know someone who evokes all these things very naturally in you <laughs> <laughs> i don't Sorry. know if we can ask who <laughs> no i don't want to say who but but we had a long discussion about this because i told kiran and kiran and adwait were both actually kiran was like in the middle a bit but adwait was very keen that i do the part and i was like you know i i feel that the audience should feel that he's a real creep hmm you know and when when she agrees to go to mumbai to record for him as an audience i should be frightened for her i should be like gosh where is she going please don't go there i mean you have no idea who you're going to meet he's a creep of the highest order and i don't know what he's going to do to you here i should completely mistrust him so if the casting is done in, with that in mind then then when the girl leaves from baroda and flies to mumbai i'm really scared for her you know but with me there my fear was that you would kind of be like you know he's a funny guy he won't do you any harm you know kind of thing yeah so so that that made sense to adwait but adwait's point was that when the payoff happens when he actually flips and he actually helps the girl uh, then if it's me it will probably mm-hmm. it will add a lot more to the film so i tested yes. i i did a screen test for the part Oh. And then I was having so much fun doing the screen test. Yeah. <laughs> I said no, I have to do this. Here. Yeah. Where do you get to be rude to people all the time? <laughs> you know, you can just be rude to anyone. You just flirt with every girl you meet and it's like, yes. "Whoa." And the clothes. And the, amazing, yeah, the clothes. amazing clothes, yeah. So, <laughs> the most obnoxious character that I've played. <laughs> and and I I just really enjoyed mm-hmm. playing it. I'm sure many people in the audience know what an amazingly big hit both Dangal and this film was in China. Yeah, yeah. What how do you explain that? Well, you see the thing is that uh, a lot of people uh actually uh, even I haven't figured it out. <laughs> the, the but the best I can tell you how it happened. So it, it's not as if Dangal was just suddenly out of the blue became a huge success in China. It's, that's not how it was. Mm-hmm. What happened is three it's three idiots mm-hmm. became a huge success in China, and it became a success. Uh, when I got to know about it, I was like, "But the film's not released in China. You know how has it become such a success?" So I understood that it was on pirated websites uh, that that kids went and saw the movie. and well, the way it began is a few kids had probably seen three idiots i'm talking of chinese kids 
and they saw it and they it kind of became viral it went viral and it went so viral that suddenly all of china had seen three idiots because first the kids saw it so first the kids saw it and then they showed it to their parents and they said look at this you know because apparently in in china they have a similar problem of parents being really anxious about their children uh and and forcing them to do stuff so that happened with three idiots and then when three idiots happened the thing that happened after that was a lot of audiences in china started looking for my films online and they went online and they found tarez amipur and they found rangde basanti they found lagan mm mm-hmm. and they started watching my films and started sharing my films and all this is on pirated websites <laughs> so i really have to thank piracy for my <laughs> for my <laughs> Yes. 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 Seriously, I have to thank Piracy for my uh, you know my stardom in China because they just went on and started watching all my films. And uh my films began releasing in China. For example, Three Idiots did finally release in China, but one year later everyone already had seen the film. <laughs> and the second film that released was PK. And PK also released one year after its release in India. So when I went to promote PK uh that is the first time i went to china and um i i went to a television show with a live audience of 200 people and i asked the host to ask the audience how many of them had already seen pk because it had released one year ago in in india and when he asked him the question all the audience in in the 200 people they all put their hand up <laughs> they were really happy we've seen pk and i was like If everyone has seen Peaky, who's going to go to the theater? Why am I promoting the film? Why am I here? Why am I promoting the film? But that's the truth of the matter. Everyone had seen Peaky before it came out in, in theaters. So Dangal was actually the first film that came out in China theatrically before it had come out on pirated websites. Yeah. So that settled, and it did huge business. It did four times the business that it did in India. Yeah. Amazing. And what about Secret Superstar? And and Dangal was huge in India. It was the biggest hit in India at that time uh, until Bahubali came and beat it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. So it was huge, and it did you know four times of, uh, the business of that uh, in in China. And uh, so what I realized when I went for the first time to China is that, and this is something I really respect about the Chinese audience. is that they are a people who are extremely welcoming of you know stories and content from outside their own country because when i went there i met some of the leading actors and creative people and they had seen five or six films of mine mm. and i hadn't seen their films and i felt very ashamed it was very i was feeling very awkward i was i was like wow these guys are so cool yeah you know they they and and remember they have to because it's not available they have to go around looking for the film on on laptops or whatever so the fact that they welcome films from outside of their own culture i mean as indians for example how many of us go around you know watching films from china or france or italy we don't it is a very small section of people in india who watch world cinema the larger you know majority of indians don't really go around watching films from other parts of the world but china does that's it's to their credit that they are so welcoming as a, as a culture and what do they think of the songs they actually loved the the so when i saw dangal with the audience in china uh they were reacting to the film exactly how we indians react <laughs> there was absolutely no difference they laughed at exactly the same moments they cried at the same moments they clapped when the national anthem played Yeah. So so it was just the same. And uh it, it was identical. And and then the Secret Superstar also did huge business. Uh did you know that Secret Superstar, which is a really small film in India, uh is the fourth highest grossing f- yeah. Hindi film in the world. Mm, yes, I read that. And yes. that's because of China. Yeah. That's because of China. So Dangal is one because of China. We managed to beat Bahubali because of China. 
Then there's Bahubali. Then is uh, one of Salman's films. I think it's Bajrangi Bhaijan. Yeah. Yeah. Bajrangi Bhaijan. And then is Secret Superstar. It's extraordinary. It beat yeah. PK. PK was uh, the fourth highest, and now PK is the fifth highest hmm. because of China. It's extraordinary. Yeah. You know how interesting. What do you think of the fact that they all call you Uncle Amir? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's really cute. Yes. So, uh, so they call me Mishu. And shu, shu shu in Chinese is Tau. You know, in, in, in Hindi we say Tau is uh, the, the father's elder brother is Tau. So in Dangal, wherever the subtitle came or wherever they had done the dubbing, it was Shu Shu. <laughs> so if, if you remember, the, the, my nephew in the film says Tau Ji. You know, there's a lot of Tau Ji, Tau Ji in the film, you know, in the voiceover. So each time he said Tau Ji, the subtitle would be Shu Shu. So that's where they got it from. So they got the shoo shoo from there yes. and they got the me from Amir. Yes. And they made it me shoo. Oh, nice. So that's what they call me in China. Me shoo. That's lovely. It's lovely. Now, to go back a little bit, is, uh, I just wanted to talk about Tari Zameen Par because hmm. that was your first film as a director. And, uh, you know, I think everybody here knows that you worked with your uncle Nasir Hussain Saab for, as a assistant. assistant. Yeah. What did you learn from him that helped you when you made Tare? Uh, I don't know whether I can tell you exact incidents like what helped me. It's, it's when you're working with someone and you imbibe a lot of things, you know, as you go along. I worked with him for four years. So I learned a lot, of, a lot from him uh, about many aspects of filmmaking. And I can't pinpoint which one really helped me. I think. All of what I had learned as, as an assistant with him, and all of what I had learned as a creative person, as an actor, when I worked with different directors, helped me. All of that helped me when I made my first film. So when I'm working with Mansoor, uh, there's a lot I learned from him as a director. I'm not his assistant, but as an actor, I'm observing how he, how he works. When I work with Rasan Toshi, uh, you know, when I work with, uh, Ashutosh, all of these people, all the directors I've worked with, I've learned something or the other from each of them. Mm -hmm. And then I've learned a lot from my uncle, as you rightly said, when I was assisting him. So you, I kind of absorb, you kind of absorb as you're, as, you're, as you're working and going along, you absorb a lot of things, you know? You don't realize how it's kind of getting stored in you. Mm -hmm. yeah. And then it all comes out when you're, when you're in that position, I guess. I, I think... Um, Uh, yeah, that's the best way I can answer. Has everybody seen Tari Zameen Par? Yeah. <laughs> well, basically, it's a, for those who haven't, it's a, about a young boy who has just... I, I think it was shown a couple of days ago, right? Yeah. 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 Did you all see it here again? Yeah. yeah? Okay. So if we could possibly have clip number four. It's a very beautiful and powerful film. And I remember when I saw it, I really felt how restrained it was. And that really touched me that you held back a lot and you let things happen. Like in this scene, is really it's a non-verbal scene, mm -hmm. you know, and how the anxiety of the child. Yeah. Uh, how difficult was it for you to direct a young kid? Uh, you know, actually, it wasn't so difficult because uh, Darshil is, is a very gifted actor. And, and I realized while I was um, uh, making the film that... Yeah. We can't hear Someone you. Someone saying something. So, yeah. uh, I realized that the, the kids in the film, that is the Sheel and the other boy who's with crutches, uh, I had to direct them very little. Uh, they re usually got it bang on, you know. I, I would narrate the scene to them, they knew the script, of course. And I would tell them a few things and, you know, they were like, there. I had to work a lot more with the elders, actually. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, they were all very good actors, you know. Uh, they were all very well selected and very well cast for each of the parts. But actually, if between any, the teachers and the elders were the ones I had to work a lot more on. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and actually, um, I was just trying to be, as a director, I was just trying to be honest in communicating what the script was saying. And I thought Amol had written a beautiful script. And, and so I, my job was just to narrate it honestly. I had to just be honest and, and narrate it. 
you know. You know, as you said, you've worked with many different kinds of directors. Yeah. What instruction that they give you as an actor, you as an actor, has helps you the most? Do they, you need some big explanation or just a concept? No. Uh, so it's different, it's different things at different times. Usually what helps me most is when a director tells me, when, direct, when the director gives me a different perspective of looking at the same scene, or gives me a different perspective of looking at the same moment, and that surprises me, and I'm like, oh, you know, I never thought of, I never thought of looking at it this way, and that really helps me many times. And uh, yeah. Can you give me an example? No, I'm not sure I can give you an example. Uh, no, <laughs> I can't give you an example. Uh, but uh, yeah, th that's the thing that that helps me most is when is when directors actually. Uh, so when I was directing, I also realized that what I really had to do was get the actor. See, See, there are two things to it. One is, does the actor understand what you want from him or her? Has the actor got it that this is what is required? Sometimes you, re you need a, a number of layers of what the actor is feeling at that time. It's not sometimes so clear that it's anger. It's not just one emotion. It's, you know, it's many emotions. So if the actor has got it, that's the first uh, thing you're concerned about as a director. Has he understood what I want? Mm. And the second thing is, the actor has understood what you want, but now can he give that to you? There are two steps. So even as an actor, have I understood what the director wants? And two, can I actually execute it? If you know what I'm saying. Yeah. So, so there are two uh, stages to it. One of, un because if an actor hasn't understood what you want, then you're, you're on a different playing field. He hasn't got it. And when sometimes that happens, when an actor hasn't got it, and no matter how you explain, the actor hasn't got it, then you are left with the last resort, which is giving him very precise instructions, which you really don't want to do normally. So, for example, if, if, if I were to tell an actor that, you know, I want you to be listening and absorbing and trying to understand. And you are half understanding, half not, you know, it's like... And that person is, you know, giving me either clear understanding or completely con complete confusion. I don't want either. So then I might be forced to tell the actor, okay, okay fine, you cameras are rolling now. And then I tell the actor, okay, now just follow what I'm saying to you. And I tell the actor, okay, now look down at your shoes and then look up here, look at the ceiling. Now, these are, these are very specific instructions I'm giving. But yeah. a combination of these physical actions will give me that feeling. Yeah. You know, you don't want to do that. Ideally, you don't want to do that. But as a last resort, you end up doing that. You mean you prefer this to be spontaneous and... No, because I want the person to understand what I want and then yeah. for him or her to internalize it and then bring it out in their own way. Yes. Uh, and, and also surprise me, yes. you know, many times. Yes. And, and uh, yes. uh, I want the actor to go beyond what, I, what, I, what I'm yes. thinking. Yes, because it's clear that you like... It's only when you're not getting what you want that you go into specific... Okay, okay. you know, sometimes actors also say... Uh, sorry, sometimes directors say, I'm going to show it to you and just give me that. Just, yes. just follow what I'm doing. Uh, yeah. But that's like the last resort. But, yeah, it was like Amish seems to really like to be surprised because when we were going to prepare for this evening, and I asked him, I prepared some questions. Do you want to hear them? He said, No, 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 no. Just ask me. So yeah, yeah, I don't huh? like. You don't, don't like, like that kind of. Yeah, I like the spontaneity. Spon so, for example, I'll, I'll tell you one one very difficult thing that occurred in uh, that is a <coughs> Now, Darshil is a wonderful actor. And, you know, I, I, I'll show you a moment. I'll do it and show you so you'll understand. When we were doing this, going through the screen test, we needed a kid who is kind of lost in his own world. And, you know, he's so... Uh, 
there's a scene when he's in the classroom and he's looking out of the window mm. and there's a little puddle he's seeing a little puddle and the sunlight reflecting in it and when a wheel of a cycle goes into it it kind of gets disturbed and it comes back so he's lost in that and you can vaguely hear the teacher saying ishan mm. ishan ishan Thak. he looks like you know mm. and he's like what happened where am i you know that look in his eyes in the screen test i got that look here because all of the kids were like they looked at the teacher but this guy was he looked and he was like mm, where am i there's something about him that he was like what happened you know what am i doing that it was some there it was some some happening subconsciously mm-hmm. and he was a fantastic actor you have to tell him very little but one thing he had a big problem with he couldn't cry <laughs> and when we were shooting in the school and there's a scene when at night when the mother leaves him and goes away and he's in the dormitory and the kids are sleeping and the camera kind of moves into the washroom into the toilet of the dormitory and in there you see him like really weeping he's like really weeping and that's the first time you see him really weeping you know so when that scene came up he he said you know i'm an uncle i don't know how to do the scene So I said, "Why?" I said, "You do all the scenes so well." He said, "I don't know how to cry. Hmm. I've never cried in my life." No, oh, that's true because his parents were so loving and he, they were such a happy family that he actually hadn't cried in his life. And I called his mom and I said, "He's never cried." <laughs> I mean, come on, yeah. So she said, "No, he's never cried." I was like, "Whoa, okay." <laughs> so now we are halfway through the film, and suddenly I discover this guy doesn't cry. so he got really anxious and he said how do i do the scene i don't know how to cry i don't know how to cry so i said okay i said okay calm down i said don't panic i don't want you to cry i said i don't want you to cry uh can you breathe with me he said yeah i said can you imitate my breathing he said yeah i can so i started breathing regular breaths and he was breathing and then i had made my breathing irregular so he started copying me and making his breathing irregular and i said now while you're doing this irregular breathing i'm i'm not crying i said i don't want you to cry so while you're doing irregular breathing i just want you to make a face which is as if you just felt some pain someone hit you so you knocked your toe somewhere you know so you're just feeling some pain so you have irregular breathing with that put in mm. <laughs> and you have crying yeah. i'm not crying yeah ah oh, wonderful <clears throat> yeah. so i told him i said i don't want you to cry don't even don't even go close to crying just give me irregular breathing breathe irregular and then just put pain on your face and that's it and this technique you just came to you because i had to tell him how to cry <laughs> i i was a director and he said to me i don't know how yeah. to cry so i was like how do i get him to cry and you know what so i broke it down in my head i said what is crying is yeah. crying is actually it's your breathing which yeah. becomes irregular absolutely and you can't control your breathing your breathing is you know so it's your breathing which breaks and it becomes irregular and then i said you know that's the way to do it so i told him don't cry i didn't want him to panic and the moment he got that you should see how he's cried after that <laughs> my god and he used to wait for the crying scenes after that he's like amar uncle is a crying scene he he got really he really got it you know that's a fantastic yeah. technique i've yeah. never heard this yeah. wonderful so actually what yeah. i realized is a lot of acting is to do with breathing yeah when you're angry you breathe in a particular way when you're disturbed you breathe in a particular way it's all your breathing you know so if you recreate the breathing that you do when you're in that state of mind then you start going going into that state of mind it's all breathing mm, fantastic there's there's one thing that is very clear in all your films uh 
from whether it's Lagan or Dangal or Secret Superstar or Tari Zamipar, is that many of the, what you do in your films is that you make people who don't have enough confidence in themselves to believe in themselves that they can be achievers and fulfill their dreams mm. and uh, that they can overcome social barriers. And many of your films, you come back to this. In Lagan, you have, you defend, get everyone to defend the village against the tax. And again, in Dangal, you make the women, you, you open the doors for the women and then they have to go through themselves, but you still open the doors. Mm. And in Tariz Amitpar as well. And uh, this kind of feeling of uh, the hope mm. that if you encourage people, they can blossom. Mm. And are you very conscious of this in your work? You know, first of all, I have to say that all of these films have been, they've not been written by me. They've been written by different writers, and sometimes the director has been the writer himself or herself. Uh, so all of these thoughts have not originated with me. It's very important to remember and understand that. It's been, it's, it's originated in somebody else's head. And I have bought into this mm. uh, idea myself. Mm. So it's not, it's not like I'm the writer and I'm writing these kinds of scripts. But you have chosen the subject. Yes, I have. So it, my choice of film reflects the kind of person I am in that sense. Uh, but I've not written those things. And certainly, uh, you know, what I get attracted to is something that uh, it's indicative of what is there in, inside me in, in some ways. And I, I am, I'm definitely someone who believes in hope. Uh, I feel that, you know, many times I feel I'm an idealist. And I'm quite happy being that. <laughs> Uh, because I feel that if you look at it, there is so much cynicism around us. Uh, and that can be very burdening. And I feel that stories and films and poems, any, any, anything that creative people do, one of the m most amazing things that we can as creative people do is give people hope. Because hope can really change your life. And hope can make the impossible possible. And I think that is one of the things that as creative people, you know, a lot of people, sometimes people ask me that, there was a writer I met from the US, she had asked me what, what is it that creative people contribute towards society? So like cops bring in, uh, you know, safety and security, the judiciary is supposed to give you justice, uh, you know, the, the member of parliaments we choose are meant to be break, make our laws, um, etc. That was a slip. <laughs> Freudian slip. Freudian slip. <laughs> Doctors are meant to give us health, you know, architects build structures for us. What, what do creative people, what is the contribution of creative people to society? And then I realized that the contribution of creative people to society is that we bring grace to society. Mm. And we have the ability, if we so choose, to build the social fabric of society through our stories, through our songs, through our paintings, you know, different, different creative people. It is creative people who actually build the social fabric of society. The so stories I have read as a kid have made me what I am, you know. Mm. And, and so I feel that uh, that's the responsibility that creative people have, not just to give people a good time. Of course, we have to give people a good time. But along with that, we can really make you think about certain things. We can touch your heart. We can make you feel about certain things. And I think you can, and, and if you look at building a society or building a nation, when we say, you know, when we say uh, nation building is a very important, or society building, how do you build a nation? It's not bridges and schools and universities and buildings that make a nation. It's the people. It's the people that make a society. And actually, it's only the creative fraternity that can contribute to that process of building people. You know, making them feel a particular way. Making them sensitive to certain things. 
And that's the responsibility I feel of creative people. So I think giving hope is a very important aspect of that. And I may not have done it consciously, but it's happened mm -hmm. organically. That uh, leads us really to a very important series that you did, that were three seasons. I wonder whether a lot of people got to see Satyavi Jayadi here. Yes, great, wonderful. Mm. And uh, for those who don't know it, uh, we're going to show a clip, but also to understand the format. It is a variety of formats whereby you'll have various subjects, social issues discussed. It'll be discussed with uh, experts, but never losing sight of actually the people who live that reality. So that combination was very good because usually you have debates in a television studio and you don't know how it's perceived out there. And so uh, this particular episode with the clip that I had chosen was uh, talking about female, uh, uh, you know, about how the girl child, I should put it, mm -hmm. how uh, negatively the girl child is seen. And uh, we have a wonderful stories, three stories, but I think you should see it for yourself. Let's see, yeah, let's see. And it's clip number five, please. So, for those of you who haven't watched the show, this was a, a, a show in which we took, picked up different social issues that we were facing as a society, that we do face as a society, and we try to understand them. Uh, and this was on female feticide. So, in India, uh, we have a law against... <clears throat> uh, so, abortion is legal in India. Abortion is legal. But sex-selected abortion is not. So, you can't first... Hmm figure out whether you have a, you know, whether your baby is a boy or a girl. You know, and then, ultrasound. Yeah, yeah, so ultrasound has now become illegal, which I, I believe is not over here. You can, over here, you can go I to the doctor and check whether you have a boy or a girl and then decide the color of the bedroom and stuff, you know. But in India, you, you, a, a patient cannot ask a doctor what the sex of the baby is going to be. And that's against the law. And that law was made because of a reason. That reason is that when we as Indians, for some reason, when we discover it's a girl, we go in for an abortion. And so it's really uh, messing with the, uh, you know, the, the, the proportion of girl-child against the boy-child in our society. And that is throwing up many, many uh, social issues as we go along. Mm -hmm. uh, but do you think as an artist, it is important to be socially alert and aware? I think as a human being, it's important. It doesn't matter which profession you're in. Uh, mm. And this show really came about because, uh, because uh, actually I was offered a game show by, by uh, um, Star. And, uh, and that didn't interest me. I mean, I love game shows. Don't get me wrong. I love watching them. And I love being the contestant in them because it's exciting to be a part of a game show when you're the contestant, but not when you're the host. I mean, for me, you know, because there's nothing for me to do. So I said, I'm not really interested in the game show. Uh, I prefer playing the game. <laughs> uh, so he said, uh, Uday Shankar had met me, the head of Star, and he said, do you want to do something else on television? And I said, actually, I do. And this thought had been forming in my head for many years that there's so many important issues that face us as a society, but we never really get to talk to them on a national level. We don't really have a debate or we don't spark a debate on a national level. And, and often we don't have the right kind of data. Uh, so the idea was to combine hard journalism with a certain amount of storytelling. Mm. Uh, so when the storytelling part is not, you're not making up anything. You're, what, you're, you're, what you're saying is all true. But the manner in which you say it is part of storytelling. So for example, uh, when I'm doing an episode on female feticide, I don't start by saying, hey, uh, hello everyone, welcome to the show, and today we're gonna talk about female feticide. I don't do that. Because the moment I would say, today I'm going to talk about female feticide, 
most people in their bedrooms would shut the TV off and say, oh, okay, female feticide, we know all about it. And on a Sunday morning, I don't want such a grim topic, so I don't want to watch the show. I didn't want that to happen. So instead, we start by talking, I start talking about motherhood. And I start talking about who the most important person for me in life is, and that's my mother. And most people who I ask, it turns out that the most important person in their life is their mother. So I speak about motherhood. And then I speak about how, what it has meant to me, and what my mother means to me. And that kind of gets us all into a certain emotional state of mind. You start thinking of your own mother. And then I said, let's take a look at how we are treating our mothers today. And then I speak to the first lady who has been through six abortions in eight years, who has been made to, made to go through six abortions in eight years uh, because her family didn't want a girl. Uh, so the manner in which I reveal the topic to you or how it is put to you is the storytelling part of it. So in domestic violence, we had only men in the audience. We always had a live audience and the audience didn't know what the show was about. We never told them beforehand. So the live audience in the, in, in the show that, that night when we were doing uh, domestic violence was all men. And I said, you know, I don't want to welcome the audience. They're all men here. These are the protectors of our society, the bodyguards of our society. And they were all very pleased about it. And then I asked them a question. I said, where do you think our women are most unsafe? And they said, you know, in dark, lonely lanes and uh, in public transport and buses and trains, they get teased and, you know, inappropriately touched, etc. They were giving their thoughts about where their women are unsafe. And I said, that's what I thought. And I said, let's find out. And how do you find out? Because, uh, so the way to find out is you go to a, a, a woman who's been attacked will go to a police station and a hospital. She may or may not go to a police station in India because she may not want to, you know, go through the trouble of a police case and all of that. But hospital she needs to because she needs to look after herself. So I sent my team to the local hospital to find out that women, when they come with injuries, where are those injuries, where have they got those injuries? And we discovered that 60% of them had been beaten up at home. Mm. So suddenly, while the show is going on, the men in the audience realize what the show is about. And I say that our women in our society may or may not get attacked on a dark road or a crowded bus or a train, but it's the chances of them getting attacked at home are more than 50%. Yeah. <laughs> so that's a big one, you know. Now, the fact of it I'm not playing with, but the manner in which I'm bringing it out to you is the storytelling part, because then it has an impact. You're like, you know, a, a, a woman in society may or may not be unsafe outside, but for sure at home she's not safe. 50%, more than 50% chances she's going to get beaten up either by her son or her brother or her husband or her father. It came as a shock to the... It came as a shock to me first. Yeah. You know? Yes. Uh, I, I, and so uh, this show really was a huge learning experience for me to begin with. Mm. And then what we learned on the show is what we shared with, with people uh, across India. The show was in multiple languages. The first time that any show, I think in the history of television, was in... 10 languages. <coughs> Excuse me. It had a huge because, impact. Um, yes. India is a country of languages. And if I really wanted to speak to India, I had to do it in the language that people are most comfortable in. Mm -hmm. So we actually dubbed the show in uh, Tamil, Telugu, uh, Malayalam, Bengali, Marathi. Right, I see. Unfortunately, we have very 
we have little time. Yes. And uh, what has happened is that the festival wanted us to have asked various fans yep. to write in with questions. Okay. And I will, I, we only have time for three of the questions that came in by email. Uh -huh. And this leads to exactly what they're saying. Unfortunately, we only have a short time sure. to answer them. Sure. The first one came from Dr. Davinder Kapoor, and he has asked, has producing the TV show, the Satyamir Jayati, yeah. changed your life? Oh, it has, yeah, dramatically, yeah. Uh, because first of all, I, I've, I've lived a very sheltered life, you know. In, I mean, live in a city like Mumbai. I come from a pretty privileged background, and my parents gave me a very good and sheltered life. So I, I'm not aware of half the problems that so many parts of India faces. And so it was a huge eye-opener for me. Uh, so we, you know, we know about the issues that, that our society faces, but on a very surface level. Mm. But when you start researching and you start going in deep, that's when you realize, because remember the show was not just uh, about the personal aspect. So it's not just me talking to a woman who's been through, uh, you know, abortions. It's also us trying to understand the personal, which is the person who's affected, the social aspect of it, the legal aspect of it, the history of the problem, and what is the way forward. So we were trying to understand a 360 degree of the issue. So for example, in female feticide, you'll be surprised to know that what we discovered, what is the history of the problem? How did it start in India? How did it start? Have you ever thought about it? Yeah. It started in a very strange way that India was always considered a country which had a huge population issue. And every government had to face this crisis of how do we deal with so many people. So population was a big issue. And two doctors came up and they wrote a paper for which they got the Bharat, uh, not Bharat, no, they got the Padma Shri. Padma Shri is like, you, you're knighted, you know, in, in the UK, you're knighted. So these two doctors came up with the paper and they wrote, uh, they explained that we can actually determine the sex of the child before it's born in the first few weeks of pregnancy. And if we can determine the sex of the child and we can tell the couple that it's a girl, their theory was that most Indians don't want a girl. And in order to have two boys, they have sometimes six girls and eight children just to have two boys. So their theory was that if we tell them it's a girl and then we abort that baby, then they will have just two children. I see. And these two doctors were given uh, the Padma Shri. And, mm. and the government at that time, it was early 70s, they realized that this is a great way to get rid of the population, or rather reduce the population. So it's a double whammy. First, you have less children, and two, you're knocking off the girls, so they can't produce any more children. Mm. So that was the thinking. Yeah. And when, sorry? The, the doctors, as it turned out, were men, yeah. They were men. Mm. But I don't blame them, you know. It's a, you have to understand one thing. See, we need to understand the history of the problem. The idea is not to point a finger at those two doctors. Because they were in their, in their, in, in their thinking, they were trying to solve the population problem, and the government at that time also thought that this is a great idea. It took them four or five years to realize that they were going down a very dangerous route. Very dangerous. Very dangerous route. But by then, what had happened was that government hospitals had trained their doctors and nurses, uh, in, and at that time there was no sonography, so you had to remove the amniotic fluid from around the baby which was a delicate procedure without harming the baby, to determine the sex of the mm. child. And doctors in government hospitals were trained to do that. And then they were trained to counsel parents and advise them that, you know, maybe if you have a girl, then we can actually abort it for you. Mm -hmm. So that is what started the whole process. And what we discovered is that, you know, most people in India, they feel that it's the... Where do you think uh, sex-selected abortion happens? And most people say, oh, it's in the villages where people are not educated. It happens, it's the exact opposite. It happens in the big cities where people have access to education. And it happens with people who are affluent because only they can afford this. Nobody else can afford it. 
people who are poor can't afford all these procedures. That's for which uh, your expert talked yeah. about. Yeah, so what we discovered is that people who are actually poor and who are not edu educated, they don't even know that they exist. Mm -hmm. It's only the cities where, where it started where people, you know, uh, got to know. So it was the educated and the rich who were going in for this. Uh, people who are, you know, really uh, educated and we consider smart mm -hmm. and intelligent who are going in for this. Uh, so the history of the problem makes you realize a lot of things. Yeah. And then the sonography machines came in. So when sonography machines came in, it just became so much yeah. easier and it flared up. It, it just went completely out of control. Even though they're illegal. No, later on became legit. illegal. I see, okay. So by the time that the government realized, and there were some activists who wrote about this, and you know, they find the government within four years realized that they'd, they'd made a mistake and that they changed all the laws. But by then, they had trained a whole bunch of doctors who, instead of doing these procedures in government hospitals, opened up their own private clinics mm -hmm. and started doing it there because it was a huge money-making mm. machinery. So you see, to understand each topic, it was very important for us to understand uh, the different aspects of it. So for example, in, in, in uh, Domestic violence, the law is really good in India against domestic violence and it gives the, the woman a lot of rights, but women don't know about it. And a lot of them, women are scared that if they stand up to it, they'll be thrown out of the house. But in India, you can't do that. That's really interesting. The law is, is very strongly in favor of the women in India, the domestic violence law. You cannot throw out a woman from the house and she is as much an owner of the house. Yes, As the male yes, is, yeah. Yes. But women don't know that. Oh, so our attempt was to get an overall understanding of each issue and share that with people. And so in the process, all of us actually got to know so much about our own country, about the people of our country. And the other thing about this entire show for me personally was it gave me an amazing opportunity to meet with such mm. amazing people people with so much courage and such grace. You know, I met people from different parts of the country, different languages, some villages, and I learned so much from them. Yes, there were yeah. so many of them are so dignified and wonderful. I mean, we could talk the whole evening, but unfortunately, we yeah. have already we're running, I'm giving too time. long. I'll give shorter answers. So I think we have to have the house lights on. And okay. We might have to take a question or two from the audience sure. because unfortunately, we have to close soonish. Okay. So I don't know where the mics are, and uh, we might. Uh... <coughs> yeah, uh, yeah, this gentleman in black. There's a gentleman in. Yeah. Yeah, could yeah. you? I'm really sorry, but could you keep your questions very brief and short so we get more in? Yeah, sure. Hi, Amir. Hi, hi. Uh, if you have to uh, do a biopic, which uh, biopic you want to do? Oh, biopic. Well, you know, one of the characters that really uh, fascinates me is Gandhi. Gandhi is the character that really, really fascinates me. So that's that's the character I would like to do. Though it's been made before, but I would still like mm. to do that. Uh, oh, this little girl. Yeah, let's see what she has to ask. Yes. Oh, the, the mic, please. One wait, just wait for the mic to come to you. Can I come up and sing you a song from oh. a film? <laughs> come. But that will take up all yeah, the time for the is, you'll next have to few sing questions. Only one verse. Come along. <laughs> Give me a hand. Tere hi boli bolungi main. Wow. Tere hi bani kaungi main. Tere ishkarta. Chura pahan ke Mithu chur sahi rangi cha Unke Me nach di fira Me nach di fira Chama chama chaliye 
Well done. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Abhi, Abhi. Will you will you be okay going down? Thank you. Abhi, I'm afraid we're going to have to wrap soon. We're going to take a selfie. Yeah, yeah, yes. yeah, yeah. Let me do Thank that. Thank you all very, very much. Where's my phone? Can I take a photograph with you guys? I'll just take a selfie. <laughs> So we have no time for any more questions? I'm afraid not. <laughs> Thank you guys. <coughs>